Welcome and thank you everybody for joining us for our first ever virtual question and answer session at Children First where we're going to be sharing some insights with you about our response to the coronavirus and how it's impacted on the children and families that we support but also how we've continued to be there for families. We've needed your support more than we ever have before in order to reach those families that are need and want to say a huge thank you for all the support that you've given us already and also encourage you to continue to give that support without you we're not able to be there for children and families who need us more than ever. I'm delighted today to be joined by three of my amazing family uh, colleagues across Children First. We've got Liana from our family support and wellbeing team down in Ayrshire, Lisa who works in our money advice team and Marion who supports families in our family group decision making team. Um, all of our, my colleagues that are with me today work in areas that have seen a rise in demand for help over the past weeks and months and they're going to offer um, many insights and information about the work that they've been doing over the past few months and an answer to the questions that we've asked. But first things first, introductions. At Children First we use our kit bag, we use it with the children and families that we support and we use it as a way to connect with each other to make sure that we're fully present in conversations and that we've connected before we get into the content of our conversations. So today we're going to introduce ourselves using our lovely colour card which helps us just tune in to how we're feeling. Um, I'll start. My name is Mary Glasgow and I'm the Chief Executive at Children First and today I'm feeling purple. And for me, purple is a colour that I associate with purpose and purpose to me really matters. It's about what's the purpose of Children First and what's my purpose in leadership at Children First to make sure that we really are there for the families that we want to support and that we offer them the right kind of support. So I'm going to now invite each of the panel um, to invite themselves and share with you the colour that they're feeling in the way that we normally do. So, Marion, can I come to you first? Yeah, um, I'm feeling turquoise today. I wore my turquoise blouse and I went for a walk before this and it was a lovely sky, although it's grey, there was tiny wee bits of turquoise through it. Um, and uh, I think that's a, a hopeful colour. Um, and when I work with my families and children i'm always full of hope for them um, and i hope that with working with them that they end up feeling hopeful about their futures so that's my color today lovely thanks marion lisa can we get ask you next yep um i'm feeling quite yellow today i'm feeling quite bright energized um, and I'm looking forward to sharing with everybody today what we do with the money advice team in children first uh, thank you and Rihanna so I think for me I'll be the kind of nice bright grassy green color and for me it is quite a fresh color green and I think it represents nature for me I think in the last few weeks I've definitely connected more with outdoors and it's really helped me get through some of these difficult times being able to be in the garden and be outside and also I think green's a bit like the traffic light. I'm kind of ready to go and excited about um, the Q&A today. And I suppose moving forward with our support with families coming out of lockdown, we're just ready to do things a wee bit different and respond to what they are needing. Fantastic. Thanks very much, everybody. And thanks to all of you for submitting your um, questions to us. We're grateful to see a few familiar names on the list that we recognise. We've got some questions about our family group decision making service that Marion's involved in. And the first question is from Anne, who's in Western Bartonshire. And Marion, what she's asked is, what's the purpose of FGDM, family group decision making, and why is it needed? Well, the purpose of um, family decision making or family meetings, as we sometimes shorten it for families, is that we can bring families together and they, um, for the first time usually, have the opportunity to come together and be part of the decisions that are being made about their family and about their children. They can do it voluntarily, they're not forced to do it. It's very different and unique from any other meetings that they've had before. 
Um, and it's looking about the strengths within their family. And when I talk about family, I mean the wider family, the wider circle around them and the children. It's totally child-centered. It's about the children. We focus on them throughout the whole process. And at the end of the family decision-making process, the family have come together in a special family meeting where they themselves have their own private family time and produce their family plan. And that's centered around the reasons why they had it in the first place. And it's usually about struggles that the family are having. It could be concerns about the children's safety, their well-being, um, and the family come together and they make a plan about how they're going to move forward um, totally on what the children need. Um, and it's uh, it's about moving into the future. It's not about the past. It's not about blame. And it's letting them take a bit of control of what's going on in their families and finding their own solutions. And we know that when families are involved and they participate in the decisions that are being made, that the outcomes are actually better and they're definitely much better for the children. So that's a family group decision making meeting in five seconds <laughs> longer. <laughs> and it, it, it's the, the reason why they are needed is because there are lots of families in their communities who are really struggling um, and other professionals are involved with those families and, and have concerns about the children, about their safety, their well-being, and that could be about their physical well-being, emotional, it could be about their education, and it's about giving families that opportunity to try and sort that out themselves and find solutions so that children can remain at home, can stay within the care of their family, um, and that they have that circle of love and support around them. Thanks, that's great, Marion. And it fits really well, doesn't it, with our children first belief that children do much better when they can be raised safely within their own families, wider family and communities. And FGDM is a really good way to prevent children being removed from families. We've got another question from Susan, who's a staff member at Children First, just to build on that. You've touched on some aspects already, but she's in the community and is often asked by people, so how has um, FGDM or family group decision making meetings helped the families that you work with? So I wonder if there's a, a particular example where a child was at risk and where you were able to pr produce a plan with that family and really keep that child at home, but also keep them safe? Yeah, definitely. I've got lots of examples. Um, one of, um, and I love working with um, all of my families, but um, one of the first families I worked with and one that um, I will always remember, um, they, were, they were a big family, but um, there was four children um, and the parents were really struggling um, with their own issues. And um, although they were trying to deal with that, the impact on the children um, was concerning um, social work, concerning um, school. And they were referred to our agency to look for family support, but basically they needed some other family member to take on the care of the children. Social work did not think that there was any family that was suitable. Um, the, a lot of the family members had, had their own issues and, and social work really felt that these four children were going to be placed into care um, very quickly. But um, Bringing that family together was amazing because they just proved everyone else wrong. Everybody um, who had contact with the family just didn't see the potential there. And it was fabulous. Um, I think at the first, that, that meeting, the first meeting, the main family meeting, there was 18 um, people, family members there and, and, and social work, school, health. Everybody was amazed at that. Um, and through that family meeting and the family meeting process, there was two family members that were able to take the children. Mm -hmm. um, so prevented those children being put into care. But the, the children stayed with in the family. So they stayed with um, relatives, but they had contact with their parents every day um, and at weekends. Um, at first that had to be supervised, but then the family took on responsibility for that. And it brought the family who um, 
you know, some of them hadn't been speaking to each other. It brought them together around these four children and really made a huge difference. And these children, after quite a wee bit of time, um, went back to their parents and relationships were repaired. The children didn't lose the relationship with their mum and dad. They kept that, which was so important. So an experience of being removed from their family could have been so traumatic. And it, because of the family coming together in that process, it, it just made it so much easier for them. So that's that's one of my favourite stories. It's a lovely story, Marion. Thank you. And it highlights, I think, the way that we work at Children First in partnership with local authorities and social work departments, for example, who are often you know, charged with that quite difficult job to have difficult conversations with families about keeping children safe. And we're involved in the middle, supporting the family to have a voice, representing that voice alongside um, the family to some of the agencies that have to do that. So I just wondered if you thought, if you had some thoughts about how important it is that, that children first are kind of almost neutral and independent in the, in the process. It's absolutely vital that we're independent because a lot of the families we work with, um, they have been through a lot. There have been a lot of professionals involved with them. And they sometimes feel very judged. They feel very blamed. The family decision-making principles is that it's blame-free. It's about the future. We're focusing on the future. We're not going to judge you about the past. And so when I um, first start working with families, I, I really work with them about explaining that and building a relationship of trust and that I don't need to know all about their past. I just need to help them move into a better future for them and, the, and their children. So I think that um, that allows us to engage with um, families in a much more honest way, in a real way. And trust takes a long time to build, but um, when families know that you're independent, that immediately, it's like a switch going on for them. They feel it's like someone's listening to them, someone's valuing what they have to say, um, and they feel respected. So they engage with you much better. It, it's fantastic. And also, particularly for the children and young people that we work with, um, in the process, we're talking to people, we're asking them their views, their concerns, we're, we're asking the children and young people, what is it that you want to happen? What do you would like to change? Um, and there's, sometimes they feel that they, they're just telling adults what they expect them to hear. Um, but if you're independent and you're working with them, you can really say it's really important what you think do you know, and it matters. The same for the adults and the family. What they what they say matters because this is their family, and they are the experts on their family. So I think it would be very difficult for somebody to do it if you weren't independent. Because when I start, I just want to be there for the family. I don't have another focus. Yeah, we're always aware of child protection concerns, anything that might be raised, and we have to be aware of them. But we're really there to give the family a chance, a unique opportunity to, to work together and to be heard and valued to do that. Thanks, Marion. We've got a couple other questions on FGDM. The next one, which I think you've um, again probably answered, but I suppose I suppose if it's from Jessica in Edinburgh, it's a great question. Jessica wants to know: so, what overall difference can FGDM make to a child? So, if you were to answer that um, in one sentence, what difference does it make to a child? It's life changing. It's absolutely life changing for children, um, depending what the outcomes are of that and the plan but the fact that even before the family have their own private family time and make a plan the fact that family have got together they come to a meeting and they show that child a young person that we care about you we love you and we want you in this family um it, it just amazing and for some young people who aren't living with their family, and, and there are very good reasons for that when that happens, um, and working with them, having family meetings, and bringing them together with their family around contact and rebuilding relationships with their families, 
you see a different child at the end of it. You really do. It's Lovely. fantastic. And then the last question on FGDM is from somebody that we know really well, Annette, who's the, the chair of one of our fundraising and committees down in Lockerbie. She's really interested to know when FGDM, when family group decision making could be available nationwide. So she's saying she's hearing a lot about families in her local area who desperately need help um, to bring together family support plans and she knows it would be beneficial for them. So when we might, we might expect this to go nationwide. Um, do you want to go first and then I'll maybe come in with some of the national context from a children first yeah. point? Yeah, I think, well, you'll talk about that, that uh, how much um, as an organisation we campaign and strive with local authorities, Scottish government. Um, but it's also about working with professionals that, that, that we, we meet in our everyday working life and who are around families, about letting them know that this is available. Obviously, um, it's about finances and we're hoping people will donate. Um, the more um, children first are be able to do it, and, and we've been promoting FGDM in Scotland for over 20 years and we're growing and building um, our coordinators, we're training coordinators from all over Scotland. So it's everybody's right, every family's right to have a meeting. So the, the more that we can promote it and professionals see the success of it and the positive outcomes for family, but it would be great if it was every single family had it before any decisions were made. So Brilliant. I don't think I need to add much more to that, <laughs> Mark, and That was a brilliant and really a full answer, other than to say at a national level, we are passionate and we, we champion the rights of children to stay at home and be raised by their own families wherever we can. And we're, you know, often in conversations with national and local government to say no decision should be made about any child um, without their whole family being involved and we need to find ways to encourage that but that was fantastic Marion a, a brilliant example of how our passionate and informed and knowledgeable skilled staff make a huge difference to children and families and communities all over Scotland thanks so much um, so we've now got some questions for our money advice colleague and Lisa the first question we've got is from the National Lottery Community Fund and they help children first money advice and parent line services and they're asking what does the money advice team do? Okay so um, we do various different things but we first of all we can help with debt so with debts um, we what we try and do is build a picture of the family circumstances first of all we'd look at what income they've got coming into the house what they've got going out of the house and um, what debts they actually have and talk to them about what's a priority debt what's not a priority debt to ensure that they are meeting the family's essential needs a lot of people have fear of not making payments to loans and credit cards so they'll make these payments, but then leave them short to buy food and things. So we have a conversation around that. Um, we that then will give us a picture of what the actual circumstances are, and we can then talk to them about what is the best solution to get them out of debt. Um, so we can negotiate with creditors um, to take away the anxiety of having to pick up the phone and do that themselves. Um, that in turn will then reduce the telephone calls that they're receiving and the letters. Um, we can look at statutory debt solutions, so we can look at supporting them through sequestration, which is the Scottish term for bankruptcy. Um, we can look at other debt solutions and more formal debt solutions, such as the debt arrangement scheme. Um, so what we try and do is we, we let the families know about what all their options are. We talk to them about what the risks, the benefits and the consequences of each of these things are. And we try and give empower them to be able to make a decision for themselves of what they think is the best thing for them to move forward rather than what we think is the best thing. Um, we also deal with benefits as well, so we can do benefit checks to make sure that they're receiving everything that they're entitled to. We offer full support with that, so we can help to fill in the application forms, which can be daunting in itself. Mm -hmm. You know, when you receive an application form that's 50 pages long, um, 
we help to support them for medical assessments as well. Um, we build up a great relationship with the family, so we're there to help them again go to a medical assessment, which is a really frightening experience, but being there is that support and that friendly face. Um, so it's great that we can do that. Um, we offer budgeting support as well, so make sure that they're making the most of what income they do have coming in. Look at, are they paying too much for products? We can help with changing el um, energy tariffs um, and just make sure that they are making the most of what they've got coming in. Um, there's grants and things that we can apply for. Um, so again, we help with the process of that. Um, that could be for white goods, sort of there's a debt or a, cri a crisis or an emergency. Um, and basically what we try and do is give them the tools that they need to become more financially capable um, and to be more resilient so that if they do hit a bump in the road again further down the line, they've now got the tools that they need to stop the debt cycle reoccurring. Lovely. Thanks very much, Lisa. And the, the brilliant thing about money advice work is it really attends to those initial practical needs that families have got. Yeah. We get a lot asked, you know, we get asked to support families a lot from social workers or health visitors or teachers about all sorts of things. But we know the thing that matters the most to families immediately is have I got enough money to manage? Have I got a roof over my head? And it really fits well within our um, work to really tackle poverty and make sure that children and their families have got the basics yeah. um, in place. But we've got another question from David, who's in Clyde Bank, a really interesting question and one that I know families worry about a lot. And he's asking, do we pass any details on from the, the people that we work with to other agencies? So we do share information um, with other, other agencies but we would always obtain people's consent first of all and when we're sharing information it's usually within the family's interest to do so because it's when we're maybe negotiating with the creditors or we're applying for grants on their behalf so of course we would need to share um, their information but we would always obtain a uh, permission beforehand. Thanks very much. And the next question is from Karima, who's in Edinburgh. And Karima's asking, is money advice different at Children First um, than it is at, in other organisations? <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's, it's very different. Um, I think when people think of money advice, um, they think of it being very formal, um, having to wait maybe a couple of weeks to get an appointment uh, with a money advisor sitting across a desk. Um, and that's completely not what we do. Um, a lot of people that have maybe engaged with that type of service in the past have maybe went to um, for the first initial meeting and been told to go away and, for example, open up a bank account. And they've not known what to do to do that. And they're not being offered the support to do that. So that can then lead to debt avoidance, more phone calls, more letters, more anxiety. Um, and that's not what what we do we the money advice model that we have is run the exact same way as the family support model is we very much work in partnership with the family support worker um, and that's to make sure that the family's getting a whole holistic approach we are meeting their expectations and what they need and we're going at their pace as well which is most important um, as money advisors we understand trauma neglect, addiction. Um, we meet families in their safe space where they feel comfortable and able to open up and talk about their situation because it's a brave thing to have to do to admit that, you know, I do, I'm struggling financially. Um, so we always make sure that they're comfortable. We can go to their home, we can meet in schools, the recovery cafe, whatever they feel comfortable. Um, the other thing we do is we, we don't judge and um, we don't judge their spending habits, the reasons why they got themselves into debt. Um, we basically hold their hands through the whole process. It's a very hand holding process. So, for example, we wouldn't just send someone away and say you need to go and open up a bank account. We would talk to them about what their needs are of that bank account. We would make the appointment with them. We would go to the um, appointment and would make sure that they had all the documentation that they need to open up the bank account. Um, the difference with ourselves as well is as money advisors we do debt and welfare 
um, most other organisations will only do one or the other. So people would have to speak to, you know, as, as I've said, it's hard enough to be brave and have that conversation with one person, never mind having to do it again with somebody different. So it's great that we can help them with money and um, debt advice. I also think we've got a bit more time as money advisors as well. Um, if you were to go to a standard money advice service, you would be given an hour, an hour as appointment. You would be expected within that first appointment to have your income and expenditure completed. Now, we also have to do that, but I understand that if I go to someone's house and mum's just having a terrible day and she just needs someone to sit and listen to her, that's what I'm there to do. So, you know, we go at the family's pace, we'll get there but it might take us a few weeks and that's okay. It's okay to do that. Um, we've also got more time to be able to go to the medical assessments, which no other org organization would have the time or the resources to be able to do. And that's really important because as I said, it's such a daunting experience for the people that I take to these medical assessments. So to have me there, because I've built that relationship with them, just to sit and chit chat with them to keep their minds off things while we're waiting in the appointment room really does make a difference and it really does put them at ease. Um, if we had to refer them on to another agency as well, we've got the time to be able to support them. So if they had to go for a, an appeal, for example, we would still go with them to the tribunal because we've been there from the start and we want to make sure that we're carrying it right through to the end so we get that final decision for them. Um, I think what we try to do as well is, is as I've already touched on, to empower folk. Um, it's important that people become more financially capable so that, you know, we give them the tools that they need mm -hmm. to be able to handle the situation again, should it happen in a few weeks or a month or however much down the line. And because we work in partnership with the, the family support workers as well, I think people are more willing to engage in the trust in the children first way, which will then stop the debt cycle reoccurring. Lovely, thanks Lisa. That was such a good illustration of our holistic approach, isn't it? That we understand family life is complicated and yeah. your, your money worries affect your relationships, affect you being there for your kids and being able to cope generally in that lovely, kind, practical and emotionally supportive way that you've described us getting alongside families makes a massive difference. So we know that income goes up once you've done your work and that makes a direct difference to the experience that children have living in families where poverty is an issue. It was just, it's just so central to the way that we work. So thanks for that. We've got another question from one of our younger supporters. We've got Nathan asking a question and it, it, it follows on from your last point about becoming independent financially. So Nathan's saying that he had his birthday last week, <laughs> his seventh birthday, and his question is, should he save some of his birthday money like his mum wants him to do, or should he spend it on a transformer boat, which is what he wants to do? Oh. <laughs> well, Nathan, I think you should spend it and buy the transformer. <laughs> I mean, anything like my kids with birthday money, it just burns a hole in their pocket. <laughs> um, so what or what you could do is look to see if you can find something maybe slightly cheaper so you can get whatever you want and save a wee bit for later. <laughs> thanks, Lisa, and uh, uh, thanks, Nathan, for your question and for your support to, to Children First. <laughs> Another question for you, Lisa, is from Callum, who's in the Scottish Borders, and he's asking a specific question about how um, families' experience of coronavirus has a, a, a affected our money advice work. Have we seen an increase in that and how are we responding? Yeah, um, there's been a huge increase, which is to be expected. Um, we knew as a money advice team that it was going to be a huge worry um, and Children First obviously recognise that as well. So um, within the money advice team, we have increased hours. Um, we've got funding for Parentline 
Um, so we're acting as an additional resource. So generally we have um, money advisors who cover pockets of Scotland, um, but we're now dealing um, nationally. So we cover the whole of Scotland. So anyone that um, calls into parent line that has any money or financial issues um, are transferred over to the team so that we're able to respond and to help um, them as well. Now, that in itself has been very challenging for us as money advisors is because each local authority deals with things differently um, so the internet has became our best friends <laughs> looking up information um, also with all the changes and the announcements from the government from the dwp so we've had to make sure that we're keeping ourselves up to date with all the knowledge to, to make sure that we are giving the best advice um, to people um, we've kind of changed as well what we've been doing. Myself, I've managed to source um, food for families and been out delivering that. Um, families that are um, shielding, I've been out picking up their medication and picking up bread and milk and delivering that to them. And as a money advisor, that's amazing that I can support in that way. And, and Children First allows me to, to support in that way because, again, it's not something that any other money advisor would probably be able to do. Um, so although it's been challenging, it's been so rewarding. Um, from March until now, we've helped 85 families, um, which is amazing. And from that, through grants and from income, we've generated £237,000 for mm. families. So we've made such a huge difference, um, which is great. It's fantastic, isn't it? And that money, that additional money makes a massive difference to the children and those families. It means they've got food to eat, it means they've got clothes to wear, it means their, their parents are less stressed and worried about things. And I suppose one of the things I would say um, at Children First is we are really, really keen to make sure that all of the families that we support have access to good money advice and we'd love to have more money advice workers embedded in all our family support and wellbeing teams. And that's one of the things that we would like to in see an increase in our funding um for we've got another question from tom in aberdeen and tom wants to know how families can access money advice at children first i think you've answered that but do you just want to give up yeah. just clarify that again lisa just so that folk are really clear that if they're out there listening to this um broadcast and are interested or in need of support what's the simplest way that they can get in contact with the money advice team so we do have, as I said, we've got, we cover um, Glasgow, East and West Lothian and um, North Ayrshire. So all our referrals would come direct from the family support workers working with the families. But we have became the additional resource in parent line. So if any families are struggling, they can contact parent line. Um, that's open seven days a week. So they would just need to contact parent line um, and the referral would be passed on to one of the team to give them a call back to assist. Fantastic. Thanks so much, Lisa. And thanks to everybody who's made a donation to children first or wants to go on and make a, a donation. You've heard there the really practical ways we can help families get money in their pockets so that their children have what they need. It's a, a fantastic service that we're very, very, very proud of. We've got an incredibly skilled team, but you've also heard what a kind and compassionate and understanding team they are as well. So thanks, Lisa. And now we've got some questions for you, Liana, who's um, around our family support offer. So we've got a family wellbeing team in you know, a wide number of areas across Scotland. And obviously the community that, that you represent has experienced many, many challenges in the, the last few months. And it's great to have you with us. So thanks very much. The first question for you comes from Dr. Sophie Fleming, who's the Chief Executive of the Catanac Trust. Mm -hmm. Catanac Trust is a grant giver that offers charities support. And her question is, so what does family support look like during the COVID-19 pandemic? And how does it help families through that crisis? So I suppose family support for me, it, it looks quite different at Children First. I think um, we are we are quite strong in our message that we do stand a wee bit uh, different compared to other services. So our family support is really natural. It's about um, pitching the right level of support to families and it depends on what those families feel that they need. 
it's very much about um, a different way of being. Children first talk about the children first way. And I think um, the best way to describe that is it's it's the way we are with one another as an organisation. And that's what families receive from us as well. So our family support is very much based on relationship building. We believe that if our members of staff are able to build really strong connections with families, that that puts us in so much better stead to help them make more positive changes for their future, as Marion was speaking about. So um, the way we do that is, is just being really real with families, being really authentic, being honest from the very first moment we meet them, um, that we are totally there for them. Um, don't get me wrong, if there's anything that ever worries us about the welfare of their children or their family, then we're going to do something with that. But it's about um, just being there and really understanding a family story. Children first have moved away from doing that one-to-one -one support to children and adults. So it's not about working with an individual in isolation. It's about our members of staff getting into families' homes, into their living rooms and connecting with each and every member of that family. Because we, we've learned that actually until you know a whole family unit, until you understand that family story and where they've been, you're not going to come to an agreement on what support that family needs and you're not going to be able to help them navigate into their future. I think during COVID, um, it's presented in a kind of different way. We've had to really think a bit creatively about how we provide family support. And I suppose the strongest message I can give to people is um, it's not really changed that much. We're still supporting families. We're still there. We've still maintained the relationships that we had with families before COVID. And actually, we've been able to connect with so many more other families. Um, so our, our support has actually maybe just changed a wee bit. There's been less face-to-face -face contact, but we've been creative about how we've got around that. So we've done um, lots of different things within our team, like we've made um, wellbeing parcels for families. We've had them posted out to children. Um, and what's been lovely about that is that we've posted it directly to the children themselves. So when the postman delivers that, the children are absolutely elated that something's arrived for them. So that's been a really effective form of support. We've really upped our telephone contact with families, texts, emails. Um, we've done um, little garden visits with families just to drop something off and then have a wee chat at the gate with them. Um, just keeping ourselves safe and keeping the families safe. But I suppose that there was a moment where we were thinking, gosh, how do we how do we provide the same support as we did before during lockdown? Um, is it enough? Is it as good as what it was? And actually what we're hearing from families is it is. And what we're hearing is that there's lots of lovely moments that we're hearing from families. So in really challenging times, we're still hearing that there's great strengths in families. Thanks, Liana. Would you agree we're also hearing some stories um, about families where the pressure of having to cope with children at home all day from school and nursery, on top of money worries, on top of maybe existing problems. So for parents who've got um, issues around addiction or mental health problems because of what happened to them when they were children, that that's a bit of a pressure cooker. And it's really um, been important for us to keep eyes and ears out for those children through getting devices to families so that we can have children access learning on school and in, in schoolwork, but also so that we can see them and keep a wee eye and keep in connection because we know children are living in different um, different circumstances and some really difficult circumstances. Have you seen that in your community as well? Definitely. So I think that was one of our worries, actually, that because we weren't going to see families face to face, we were thinking that we were going to lose some of our senses, that we're able to gauge how families are doing and how children are doing. So you're dead right. We found out that a lot of families, they really weren't connected digitally very well at home. So without them being at school, they were maybe struggling to um, maintain that learning while they were at home. Um, if families were shielding, for example, they might be less able to connect with other family members and friends. So um, we were dead lucky and we were able to source a lot of devices for our families. Um, it's allowed for some of our team to 
continue to carry out family support sessions um, via Microsoft Teams using these devices, um, which has been really lovely. And actually to still be able to do a bit of kit bag input. So we used kit bag at the beginning of our session today. So we've been able to send families miniature versions of the kit bag so that they've got a kit bag at home. And then the staff member on the other side of Microsoft Teams have got theirs. And we can continue to connect using our kit bag to really have really lovely conversations and continue with this, the support that we plan to. Um, just doing things a bit differently. So it's been really vital and a lot of families have told us that they were struggling trying to maybe do schoolwork on a mobile phone screen, which just seems mad. So um, again, that's what some of those devices have gone to. And the feedback that I've um, heard directly from, from families through the teams is that our support when they've been more isolated than they've ever been before, more under pressure, more anxious about health, more anxious about money and relationships and worries, that our support's been a lifeline. It's kept folk alive in terms of the, the emotional needs that they've had just to talk to somebody, to release some of that pressure. We've been able to have support sessions with children that have kept them busy so that mums and dads have been able to go away and get a cup of tea or just take a breather. We've been, as we've heard before, delivering food and, and supermarket vouchers and sending out with the support of our donors and supporters activity packs so that children have got games to play, pens and papers to write. And some of our our, co our supporters or, or people listening to this conversation might not imagine that in this day and age, some children don't have the basics like devices or um, the data that required to use those basics or pens and paper to do schoolwork, but they really don't. And our, our family support teams and our parent line teams have been really, really important in keeping those things for families and for children, haven't they? It's been hugely, hugely important. Yeah. Definitely. We've been hearing a lot from um, parents and carers that, I mean, uh, within a period of six weeks, to give you an example, um, during lockdown, our Ayrshire services um, received an additional 50 requests for us to connect with more families, and that was crisis directly related to COVID. Um, the majority of them, as Lisa was saying, is about money advice um, because families are spending more money during lockdown. They were spending more money, which is additional pressure. Um, also, some of the families were saying that they're, they're just not used to so much time together. And like you're saying, Mary, it's like a pressure cooker. Everybody's not used to spending so much time together in the house. So a lot of our support was about trying to help parents and carers regulate. How do they have that time to check in with themselves to keep going? And it was about survival. Some parents are saying, you know, I'm just trying to get through it every hour of the day. Um, how, how do you just get by a day? And that's why some of our family support has been a lot more practical. We've had to look at what do families need right now and to get them through COVID, it has been about some of those practical things. So that's why we've seen some of the children provided with the basics like coloured pencils that maybe families don't have. Mm -hmm. um, it's been about providing families with um, you know, cleaning materials, you know, laundry detergents, um, something that's been quite commonly requested to help support the children at home is things that help them play. So to try and again change the rhythm at home and maybe to change the mood when things become a bit tense, we've helped families access um, things for outside so that we've got them bowling, you know, our garden Jenga, just things that can give them a wee bit of space outside to play to connect um, and just again just to get through another day and that's that's the type of things that the that our donors and supporters help us do so when you donate to children first that translates directly into food for families who are not used to having children at home all day from nursery and school where they would get a free school meal for example so they're spending much more money just keeping everybody fed but also families that can't afford to have, you know, can't afford to buy bikes, don't have outdoor space and need to be really creative in the way that they occupy the, the children that they, they, they have. So it's been massively important. And sometimes it's hard to get your head around the level of basic needs that, that children don't always get met. 
Um, and that, that's why our support is a lifeline. Thanks for that, Liana. What, what, we've got another question from another partner, the Robertson Trust. Terry from the Robertson Trust is asking us, so what do you think needs to be in place to support families going forward as we continue into what looks like a fairly long, lengthy period of restrictions on our lives, of children not being back at school and nursery full time? What do you think needs to be in place to support those families? We're hearing that um, the crisis may just escalate. Um, we're hearing from families that actually now they're, they're managing their finances, for example, but that might not be the case in a few weeks time. We're hearing stress already from families saying that if they go back to work just now, what happens about um, their children and the support and supervision of children when they go back to work? So again, for us, it's about support for us to try and bridge that gap. We believe that in Children First, we could help families bridge that gap between home and school when they're not back at school full time. But again, we're going to need support to be able to do that. Thanks very much, Liana. And then that's a really good example at a local level, at a national level. Terry from the Robertson Trust asks a great question because we're really thoughtful about what families need nationally going forward. We know they're going to need a huge amount of emotional support to recover from some of the stress and pressure that lockdown mm -hmm. has caused. Many of the children that we support suffer from anxiety. They live in households where relationships are really difficult or there's domestic abuse or there's parents who are struggling with addiction issues or mental health problems and they need support that reaches parents without blaming and shaming parents in the way that we've described. So we need um, to be there right alongside those families going, how has this been? What support do you need? And what we're hearing nationally is they'll need emotional support to have somebody to talk to, to tell those stories, to be clear about what's happening and have somebody to listen to. And they also need practical support for the long term, like money advice, like access to jobs, like thinking about how they're going to manage with children who are not at school all day and, and crucially that financial support going forward as well. So we're, as well as our direct support to families, we're involved, as you know, with national conversations with the government about let's do better for those families that are furthest away from having what you need, let's really change the system. And I know that that's something that the Robertson Trust are also really interested in and they're a great partner um, of ours to have those conversations. So there are some great conversations that we are part of just now um, and we really do want to make a bigger difference going forward. So the next question that we had is from, this is a question that we get asked a lot, and I know you you do, Liana, too. Generally, how long does it take for, uh, for us to support a family and to go through that kind of process of, of family support? Yeah, we're asked that quite a lot, and I think it frustrates people when we say, you know, how long is a piece of string? It's something that we, can, we can't give a, t a set time frame of. And I suppose to break it down, it's just as I said earlier, relationships are key to our support and you can't put a timeline on how long it takes to develop a, a relationship and how you build a strong relationship with someone. So again, we believe that if you've got a strong, a strong bedrock, a strong relationship with a family, that's where you can begin to explore some of the issues that they're experiencing and try and make some of the positive changes to help them navigate their future. So um, we've got we've got some families who connect with us and maybe it's a day, you know, they've come and they've wanted to check in about something. It's been a couple of calls and we've been able to help them. And then we've got some families who remain connected with us for a number of years. You know, there's a family we've connected with for, for at least four years now. So um, it's different for different families because their needs are different. Um, I think as well, it, a, a nice way to maybe describe it is that we're talking about families who have experienced significant amount of trauma and adversity. That's not something that can be fixed quickly. Um, families need to be given the time and the space and it needs to be at their pace as well. And again, you can't put a cap on that. Thanks very much, Liana. We've got another question, a great question from one of our uh, other younger donors and supporters, Lucy, who's 11. She wants to ask what the best thing is about helping children. Wow, so uh, there's so many lovely moments that I've enjoyed about my experience so far in Children First, and I think it's um, 
It's the joy of being connected to children is one of the things. I think it doesn't matter if you're a family support worker or you're the director or you're an admin support worker. I think it's that joy of being able to connect with children that really um, keeps you going. But something I love about my role and being part of Children First is that no day is the same. So I'm sure um, Lucy will be delighted to hear that some of my days it can be, um, I've been dressed as a Christmas elf at the Christmas party, or um, I've been flossing in the middle of a high school cafeteria, um, and or I've been trudging through a nature reserve in the middle of Ayrshire to see if it's suitable for a family event. So I think it's just uh, no day is the same. And I think as long as you can have fun and you can enjoy your job and see the joy of what we do for children, um, I think that's the best bits. Yeah, I'm sure colleagues would agree. Certainly one of the things that I find um, the most rewarding, Lucy, is when you see children who've had a really difficult time, who've come through a, a, a horrible period in their lives, just begin to blossom again and enjoy the ordinary things that, that you probably do as an 11 year old. A lot of the children that we support um, you know, they have some tough times, but inside they're full of the, the same ambitions and aspirations as other children. And it's our job to make sure they get an opportunity to realise their, their dreams. And it's lovely when you begin to see children coming through that process, isn't it? But just to go back to the questions, we've also got another question from Nick Addington, who's the chief executive of the William Grant Foundation, another fantastic partner and supporter of ours. And his general question is, what is it that makes Children First different? So who, who would like to answer that? Marion, have you got some thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, I think um, we make a difference. I think that we really, um, by listening um, to the, the families and the children and young people that we work with, they really feel heard and, and not they don't always have that experience. And I think that in itself makes a difference to that parent, that carer, that child, because then we will use what they say to, um, you know, inform the public, like you say, Mary, but also to inform and educate other people around that family, do you know, because um, if we don't listen to what families are telling us and we don't listen to children, young people about what they need um rather than them being told um what they need that's very different um then life the lives of families and children are not going to change so I, I i think we make a difference and i'm very proud of that I, I definitely do think we make a difference i think um we hear a lot of times from families that it, it, it does feel different to be supported by children first and um it's it's amazing that a lot of families will say it doesn't matter who you speak with in Children First or who's listening to you, they get the same kindness and the same compassion from all of us, which is really reassuring to know. Um, and a particular mum that shared that with us, she she spoke about how the confidence that she was given and the confidence confidence that was instilled as in her as a mother um, was huge. The, the impact was massive. Um, and she said, you know, from the first day that she connected with us and she was an absolute crisis, she admitted that herself. And she said that had she hadn't connected with that day, with us that day, um, she, you know, she may not be here. She said it was an absolute, I think someone said earlier, it was a lifeline. And she said that, that the kind of connection that she had made saved her life most, most definitely. Um, I know from one of our, I remember from one of our um, wellbeing teams, they were saying that a member of the family was saying that they'd had really difficult conversations with their children first support worker. So she'd had to say some really hard things about relationships and help them talk about things that they would have preferred not to. Um, but the, the way, the reason it was easier was because they felt they trusted her. And they were saying, we know she's not a member of the family, mm -hmm. but she felt like a member of the family. Our children first Work with, you know, support worker feels like somebody who genuinely cares about how well we are doing and they're prepared to say some of the some of the hard stuff because and we're prepared to listen to it because our relationships are so strong and we know that that's what makes the difference for children when you can safely get parents to say 
I, this has been difficult and maybe it's not been great for our children, but with your support, we're prepared to get stuck right in and make things better. Um, and we hold their hand and walk a bit of that road with them till they're able to stand on, on their own. It's a, a really, um, I think, distinct approach that we, we take where we believe that change is possible and families have got the answers if they just get the support that they need. Um, one of the things that I think we do need to touch on and that people will be interested in is we know that the level of increase you've all talked about, it, the level of need out there, pressure is building, the economic situation is getting worse, poverty is going to increase, emotional stress and pressure is growing. Um, it's going to be incredibly difficult out there for families and we need to find ways of meeting that need. And Lisa, I mean, the, the money aspect of this is massive, isn't it? The growing number of families that will find themselves living in poverty with really difficult financial constraints is a challenge. What do you think we can do about that to try and meet that challenge? Well, I think that's what we find is that we're speaking to families, a number of families that would never have normally had to obtain debt advice or apply for a mortgage holiday because mum and dad were working and suddenly they find a self furloughed or self-employed and no income coming in so it's been really challenging for them because they don't know where to go where to turn to so being able to have parent line as that additional resource and dealing you know with the whole of scotland has made such a big difference so you know any additional funding that we can get to keep that going you know over this time that there's so much uncertainty would make a huge difference and lots of people who will be watching watching this will be asking the question what more can can you do what more can can the community do and the the truth is by engaging with us supporting with us understanding the issues better for the the children and families we support and being understanding and your support really matters it matters because it gives a message to children that you care and we know that scotland is full of incredibly caring people we know just by the level of support that we get and so thank you so that's us. That's the end of the session. We're really grateful that you've been with us today. We're also grateful that you're interested to hear more about our work and also interested in, in helping us. So thanks to everybody that sent in questions. They were fantastic questions and I hope you've enjoyed the conversation that we've had as a result of them. Thank you, of course, to my lovely colleagues, Liana, Lisa and Marion. We are so proud of our colleagues and the work that they do. You've seen for yourselves how incredibly passionate and knowledgeable they are and they represent our colleagues right across the, the organisation. So thanks very much for you to take the time out of your day to join us today. You did a great job. And also thanks to you. Thanks to everyone who's donated for our, to our appeal. You've made an incredible difference to the families that we support. You've heard the ways in which your support has offered practical financial and emotional support to those families. So thanks very much for that. And if you haven't yet managed to donate, please visit our website by cl clicking the button below and offering whatever you can. It makes a, a massive difference. Thanks very much, everybody. And hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.